Okay, Proverbs 1 and verse 27. Just read there in verse 26 that God says, I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. So we see here more things that are going to happen. God elaborates on this calamity of verse 26 that's surely going to befall the foolish who despise his reproof. So he expounds on this fear, and he says that the fear would come as desolation. Right? So fear, I guess there's fear and there's fear. Right? Sometimes we, just, we might be a little nervous to get up and speak in front of people or something. That could be a type of fear. But that's a totally different fear than a totally debilitating fear that's going to, be, that's going to destroy you. But this is the kind of fear that God's talking about. Fear is defined as a sudden and terrible event or peril. It is the emotion of pain or uneasiness caused by the sense of impending danger or by the prospect of some possible evil. And when it says there that fear comes as desolation, well, that really matches up pretty well with 1 John 4.18, which says that for fear hath torment. It is that fear can, <clears throat> fear which is manifested in worrying, that can give you stomach ulcers, that can, it can take years off your life. I wonder if that's not why my grandpa on my mother's side died so young. He died at 61 years old, and he was constantly worrying about all kinds of stuff that rationally you shouldn't, there's nothing to worry about, but he would worry and worry and worry. And I just wonder if that didn't have something to do with him you know, having a heart attack and dying at 61 years old. We're told in 1 John 4.18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Remember, if you're ever afraid, the antidote to fear is faith. Because David said, At what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. So really, if you, ever, if you find yourself fearing anything, when you get down to the bottom of it, it's a lack of faith. Right? If you fear the economy crashing, what is it? It's a lack of faith that God will supply all your needs in, you know, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Or if you fear of dying of cancer, you're not trusting and having faith that even if you do die, you're going to go to heaven anyway. It's going to be a lot better, right? So you're looking at this life. You're only concerned about this life. It's a lack of faith. That's what it comes down to. <clears throat> so it says, fear is desolation. Fear hath torment. And you think about a lion... Lions use this paralyzing fear to capture their prey, right? They sneak up behind them, they roar, and for a moment there, the, the, the prey is just totally paralyzed, can't move, and the lion goes in for the kill. And uh, this is exactly why Satan is referred to as a lion, because he does the same kind of thing. He uses fear to destroy people. And what, what, how he really, probably how he's most successful with it is not so much the fear itself, but what you do is a result of the fear because you're afraid and then you do something sinful, right, to mitigate it or to get out of a situation where you're afraid to, to be in. Um, that's where Satan usually ends up being very successful. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, kind of like the guy in, uh, in the parable where Jesus gave out the talents and he gave one, two, and one, one. Uh, he gave... Five, five, two, and one. And the guy that he gave the one talent to, he said that I was afraid. I knew that thou wert a hard man. I was afraid and hid my talent in the earth. And God gets right to the bottom of that and says, thou wicked and slothful servant. You're afraid because you're lazy. That's what God says, right? So sometimes fear is just a, an excuse for something else. But anyway, in First Peter 5 and verse 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So yeah, fear can bring desolation. Just because like that lion, you scare him, then you destroy him. Those who reject the reproof of God's words and then reject his commandments, they have not the love of God in them. They don't love God and the love of God cast out fear. So you see how this kind of all fits in together. If you, John, first, uh, John 5 in verse 47 says, Jesus said to uh, these wicked people that he was talking to that they didn't have the love of God in them. John 5, 42 says, But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. 
Now, whether that's the subjective or the objective genitive, um, you could, one way it would be that God doesn't love you, and the other way is you don't love him. But uh, it seems like Jesus is saying that they, and I forget if it's the objective or subjective, I'd have to look it up, but um, they have not the love of God in them. They don't love God, right? And that because of that, they're not, they don't believe in God. They don't believe Moses, as he goes on to say. And because they don't have the love of God in them, then they don't have the perfect love which cast out fear in 1 John 5, 18, which goes back to Proverbs 1. These people aren't loving God because they're not obeying God. If you let me keep my commandments, Jesus said, and they don't love God, so they don't obey him, and they, don't, they can't cast out the fear. And the fear is going to come upon them, and it's going to destroy them. Now we see that the consequence of defiance of God is fear, but it's not just any old fear. It's fear that cometh as desolation, as it says there in the, ver- the verse we're looking at, Proverbs one twenty seven. And desolation is the action of laying waste the land, etc., destroying its people, crops, and buildings, and making it unfit for habitation, utter devastation, an act, or occasion of this kind. So this is some serious fear here that causes this total destruction of a person. <clears throat> so this fear that foolish men, when they disregard and mock God's warnings, they will have devastation, like a tornado, right? Because he says that the fear is going to come and destruction is going to come as a whirlwind, Proverbs 127, right? A whirlwind is a, like a tornado. So we, especially around here in Missouri, you, people that have lived here for a while, you know all about tornadoes and the destruction that is wrought by a tornado. A tornado will wreck a man's house, obviously, and, but crippling fear will wreck a man's life in the same way that a tornado would destroy his house. Both of them, will bring him to naught, to nothing, right? Fear will destroy a man's life, bring him to nothing. This tornadic fear, I don't know if tornadic is really a word, but I, if it's not, I made it up. Is it? Because it, it, it underlined it in the Microsoft Word, but sometimes they don't know what, what real worlds are. Yeah. It is. <clears throat> is it? Tornadic? Okay, good. If it wasn't, I can always make it up. You know? So I've, I've, Sounds good. I've probably, <laughs> years from now, someday, Whenever somebody gets listening to the wisdom of, of Chad, then the dictionary is going to be full of all these new words yeah. that I made up. <laughs> so. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. That's, yeah. I'm glad to know it's a real word. <laughs> so this tornadic fear, which the Lord promises, will come upon rebels, and it's going to ca- cause them distress and anguish. Distress is the action or fact of straining or pressing tightly. Strain, stress, pressure. Figuratively, it's pressure employed to produce action, constraint, compulsion. Less usually, pressure applied to prevent action or restraint. It's the sore pressure or strain of adversity, trouble, sickness, pain, or sorrow, anguish, or affliction affecting the body, spirit, or community. It's sore trouble, a misfortune, a calamity, which goes back to what the Lord said that they were going to experience, that presses hardly, especially in the plural, it's straits, distressing, or strained circumstances. So that's what the distresses are going to be. It's going to be stress. You're going to be stressed out. That's what distress means. When people don't follow God's words, they are in distress. There are a lot of people today talk about being stressed out, right? Well, it's probably because... Granted, everybody gets stressed. I get stressed out too. But a lot of times it's because you're not following God's word. Or you're taking too much on you. You've taken too much responsibility, responsibility that God never gave you to have. And then that causes distress. And it causes anguish. Anguish is excruciating or oppressive bodily pain or suffering, such, a, such as the sufferer writhes under. That's some serious suffering right there. Now notice again, it's not if fear, distress, and anguish comes on the foolish sinners who reject God. It's when. Remember what he said there in verse 27? He'll mock when your fear cometh. Right? Where is verse 27? When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Right? When it happens. (laughs) 
this description that I just gave you there of fear, desolation, destruction, distress, anguish that comes upon people that ignore God's words, this ought to make every one of us that fears God stop dead in our tracks, repent, and reverse course. Because if we actually believe what this says, that's some really serious judgment that comes on people that just disregard what God says. So if any of us, if, if we ever look at a verse in the Bible and say, yeah, I know it says that and I should be doing that, but it's probably not that big of a deal. It is that big of a deal. Anything that God says is that big of a deal. So you never want to look at a verse, look at, a, at any of God's precepts, and just say, hey, probably he was talking to other people. Or that was for them back then, and that's not for me today, or whatever. You don't want to go there. Fools will disregard, and then they'll suffer for it. Look at Proverbs 14 and verse 6. I've seen this happen. Proverbs 14, 6, 16, pardon me. Proverbs 14, 16. I've seen this happen in people's lives, and I just wonder... Sometimes I think God allows people to just go off on their own way and just stubbornly rebel against him. And he just lets things go well for them for a while. Just to, to get them solid in their rebellion. And then he judges after a while. He doesn't do it right away. Proverbs fourteen sixteen: A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. The wise man says, no way. I know what God says. I'm going to do it because I believe that he will judge me. The fool says, nah, I don't believe in that stuff. I used to know people, former church members, that basically just look at the Bible, look at the, what, what, how God says he, he will judge people that are put out of the church for discipline, and they'll be delivered as Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And they're just like, that's ridiculous. They don't believe that. You know, that, that's, that ended in 70 AD, don't you know? There's no devil anymore. He's cast into the lake of fire. You know, that happened in 70 AD, whatever. I mean, just look at these verses and say, Pff. yeah, all this talk about judgment and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the fool rageth and is confident. Well, they'll suffer for it. Psalm 107 and verse 17. And I think sometimes with people like that, God just says, he just lets them go. And he lets them maybe go on for a few years and it makes them really think, see, I got out of that church. I got out from underneath that heretic, and nothing happened. All that talk about judgment, just all a bunch of smoke and mirrors. And then, after they're nice and solid in their rebellion and pride, then God judges. Could be, I don't know. It's up to God. He says sometimes some, some men's sins are punished right away, and some they follow after. Psalm 107 and verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. What happens to these people in Proverbs chapter 1 and people that act like them is that eventually they will call upon God, but not until it's too late, as we're going to look at in the next verse. Oh yeah, they call. They, they, they listened to God call for a long time and paid no attention to it, scorned it and disregarded it. But then, when things start to get bad, and the fear and the desolation cometh, then they decide, oh, I'm going to call on God. I need to, I need to be saved out of this. But then it's too late. That'll take us on to the next verse.